Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And today, Ed, we're going to look at Walking Dead number one, one of the biggest comics of the 21st century, maybe one of the biggest comics uh, in creator-owned comics history. It's one of those rare phenomena where uh, a comic starts to sell more after issue number one. This is one of those exceptions. Like, if you put a comic out and issue two sells better than issue one, issue three sells better than issue two, they say by issue four or five you reach your equilibrium because now numbers are coming in and, and the shop owners know how many to order and stuff. If you hit big numbers, man, by uh, bigger numbers, by issue four or five, you have something on your hands. I have not thought about it that way for ever. And as soon as you say it now, my mind is racing for like, what books do that? New Warriors did that. Maybe not outselling the first issue, but it would it would grow in readership. Of course, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, because you would hear about the subsequent printings and, you know, the numbers would go up and up and they talked about it. Yeah. Um, very rare. Yeah. Bone is a great example. Uh, Cerebus. There are these handfuls of, of books historically that do that, that reverse that trend of always falling. So pretty interesting uh, note there, Ed. Um, certainly one of the best selling comics. And that's part of what I wanted to look at this comic book for, because there's a short list of these comics. I don't know how many copies of Walking Dead 1 has been printed because it's been in a zillion trade paperbacks and omnibuses. These are from the uh, Wizard World shows, which for like a year or two, Wizard Worlds in each location would have their own Walking Dead cover commissioned by, you know, local artist or, or some guest artist or whatever. And then they would give these to everybody that attended uh, all the paid admission. So huge, huge, huge numbers. You know, there's a dollar version of Walking Dead number one that Image released. I don't know if they put one out as a free comic at any point, but I mean, millions of Walking Dead number one exists in print. Yeah, for sure. And that's, that's discounting its reprinted appearances in the trades. And that one time I got to hit that New York Times bestseller list, I was up there with like five Walking Dead books. Right. And the thing is, like anybody that's buying a volume of Walking Dead, you can bet they're selling a copy of the first volume. Right. You know, you don't just start with volume 11. Yeah. So I don't have too much to say. Uh, this is a cover that I drew for the Pittsburgh Wizard World, whatever year that was here. Uh, they did two versions, one in color, one in black and white. This was based on an iconic scene from this issue that we will get into. And then I used colors that were local to sports teams. So like the black and gold of, you know, Steelers and Penguins and Pirates. Genius designer. All right. Let's begin. I assume this has probably changed a little bit from, you know, the initial uh, first printing or whatever. But I think this is all intact. And so Tony Moore doing the penciling, inking, and gray tones. And I mention that because not all black and white comics have gray tones. It's kind of a, a choice they made early on that they carried through the series. 193 issues, kind of figure out that look in the beginning. And of course, Robert Kirkman, creator, writer, and letterer uh, early on. I assume he doesn't letter throughout the book's history, although I, I don't know that for sure. But uh, that was something you'll see a lot of writers uh, especially create our own books, will handle lettering as well. Kind of makes sense because we said it with David Mazzucchelli's interview, last person to handle the art. Right. So if you're the writer and creator, it gives you a chance to maybe edit your script a little bit, make it fit the art as well as possible. These are these are young boys from Kentucky, too. You know, they're trying to keep costs down, so just handle it all yourself, man. F figure it the hell out. And Kirkman does not do a bad job. It follows all the rules that I need for good kind of like dialogue lettering, at least, because I don't like that. But uh, a lot of space in the bubble, a good font that goes along with the uh, the art. It looks like a little bit of like a John Workman kind of typeface, I would say. I did make note of that. Um, you know, we often rag against uh, mechanical or digital fonts. There's like two fonts that suck that everybody seemed to use. Right. And, and, and this is not one of them, no. so good choice. Yeah, yeah. If we can identify the name of those fonts, like, I'll certainly say it, but I just don't even know. I just, it's just the shitty comic font from the 90s that people insist on still using. All right, so what happens here, a couple of policemen have a fugitive. I think he may have escaped from a neighboring prison or county, and they've got him stopped, but he has them pinned down with a gun. One of our uh, main cops, Rick, goes to try to get his flank and ends up shot. Page one, a lot of kind of a lot of action and a lot of setup. Rick is going to be our main character, so 
this is our introduction to him going out to do something brave and uh, taking a chance and paying for it. We got to get him to. We got to get him to be out of the picture. Got to get him to be unconscious. Got to put him in that hospital setting. All Boom. right, man. Kudos to uh, Kirkman for wasting no time. That's that it. Page one set up, and here we are, some indeterminate amount of time later. Rick wakes up in the hospital. You can see he's kind of healed up a little bit. Uh, that's great. Launch right into it. Yes. No no BS, man. That's 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 my kind of comic storytelling for this kind of a comic. You know what I mean? Don't give me any nonsense. Yeah, the, the book's called Walking Dead. I'm not interested in how we get there. I'm interested in seeing some Walking Dead. So how many pages before we can see some of that? Yeah. T- Tony Moore really grows into himself like later. This is very, um, you know, this is young, young artwork. Like I was uh, buying any independent comics at the local Comic Con uh, every year. Like th- you could do that yes. then in the 90s. And this doesn't look dissimilar than a lot of that stuff. You know what I mean? The, the proportions of the face and some of the way that perspective is handled. Like, like those kind of, like, indie cartoonists of, like, the late 90s, like, they, they sort of drew like this, man. He grew into way bigger and better things, man. But but I sort of like the raw aspect because this isn't far from Air Cell. Yeah. And we should say, I think 2003 is when this starts, which is a kind of a low time in terms of sales. You know, yeah. like there there is this moment before comics start to mount a comeback, and that's when Walking Dead comes out. Yeah. Um, not a great moment. It wasn't very optimistic at the time that this would have come out, that comics and especially comic books were going to come out the other end. So uh, kind of an interesting time in that regard. And we see Rick wakes up, you know, nine panel grid, very classic storytelling. Um falls out of the bed you know to me that implies weakness maybe he's been in bed for a while muscles have atrophied but gets his bearings crawls over finds his clothes in the drawer and now ventures outside of his hospital room and this reminds me of wrestling where like you're selling you know he's not a hundred percent he's leaning on the wall all right (laughs) you know it's good it's great you know it's the body language it's it's there's a lot of uh storytelling in the art in this in this opening sequence and so that's the little bits that you see. He does kind of recover at some point a little ahead of schedule in my mind. I feel like he needs to go sleep 14 hours after walking down this hallway, but we'll get to it. So our first uh, our first zombie sighting is in the elevator. Freaks him out. Doesn't know what's going on. Nobody's in the hospital. And uh, the doors are wedged shut. There's like a piece of wood that's keeping the doors from being open. And he's like, what's going on here? Maybe not cautious enough considering he's a policeman. Like, that's a sign of something bad. Uh, but nevertheless, he doesn't know what's going on, just woke up from a coma, opens the uh, opens the door, and this is what we find in the cafeteria. Amazing. Just carnage. Yeah, and this is your money shot. This is what you're hiring, uh, you know, your artist to do in, in this issue, is, like, deliver the zombies. And I think he does. A lot of flies and maggots and stuff whenever you get a close-up, and uh, little bits of gore whenever you get a close-up. So... One of the zombies comes after him. They go down the steps and it just kind of severs his neck as they fall and crash land. Yeah, a lot of good nonverbal storytelling, man. Yeah, you know, stuff like this, pretty hard to do. Like getting a door shut and then tying it shut with your belt. It's not the easiest thing to draw. Goes out, the cars, you know, just destroyed what's left in the parking lot. I'm telling you, like this page... If this was printed up on just like that standard like shoddy like newsprint of the nineties, man, you would you would think it was like an aerosol. That's funny. I think about doing all those special editions. This would be great on like newsprint with a little yellow under it. Yeah, that'd be a funny addition to do. <laughs> like the eighties Walking Dead. It's kind retro. of like timeless. Like none of the cars look particularly modern or anything. Yeah, it's good. So he's walking along and uh, looks down, sees something horrible, and what is it? this crashed bicyclist that's rotted away, but not dead. Even like, uh, I think, and maybe I made up the, he's, his eyes watering. I was thinking that she was crying too, like in this painful in between state. That's that conundrum too. When you're a little kid thinking about immortality and you go, well, what if someone cut your head off? That would suck. (laughs) Well, cut your head off and throw it down a well or something. (laughs) That would be the worst. <laughs> Look, she her legs like busted off and stuff, so she's incapacitated there. It's so dark. This 
bits of this art reminded me of Eric Larson going through it too. Mm. So keep your eyes peeled for that, and you might see little little pieces like the hair, especially some of the teeth, just some of the mark making. And maybe he's drawing with similar tools, similar pen or something. Back to our nine panel grid. Uh, gets on the bike, you know, tries to compose himself and keeps going. So where's he going? Home, of course. And we get to this point and it's just, it's devastated. It's amazing because he still has no concept of time. Like he doesn't know how long he was out and the world has severely changed in the course of a very small amount of time. And I think that's something we could all relate to. Yeah, man. Yeah, there's some, some some unfortunate parallels reading this comic today. So he goes inside, and uh, the place is trash. No sign of his family. Nothing. And uh, he's looking around whenever he gets a shovel to the back of the head. Brained, if you will. Yes. So the little kid hit him with the shovel and then calls out to his dad to come over. And the dad's like, this dude's alive. Like you, 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 you hit this dude with a, with a shovel that's alive. It's not one of the Walking Dead. Yeah, you give him a CTE. So they they drag him inside to uh, you know tend to his wound and hopefully he's going to be okay. And he wakes up. They have some food for him and they and they talk and they both kind of catch up. So the father and son are are don't know who this guy is, and the guy has no idea what's going on. And so they're both playing catch up. Like, well, where have you been that you don't know what's happened in the last month? And he's, of course, well, who are you guys? You're not my neighbors. <laughs> so a lot of back and forth. Not too bad in terms of reading. It's not too burdened with exposition, even though we do get a lot of information there. And you do get a sense of Rick kind of coming up to speed, at least to some extent. And the story is, whatever this outbreak is with these zombies, people were encouraged to go to the cities where the government said they could protect them better. Some people did, some people didn't. Rick is hopeful that maybe uh, his family went to Atlanta, which isn't too far away. So uh, after dinner, he says, let's go shopping, which means the police station where Rick works uh, brings the father and son along with him and uh, basically, you know, thanks him for giving him dinner and watching out for his place or whatever. And they go in, they get guns, they get cars and talk about their plans. Rick's going to head to Atlanta. He's going to take the better police cruiser. This dude's staying back with his son and uh, just trying to keep his son protected, something Rick can can understand and admire and, and longs for his own son and wonders where he's at. Yeah, you're setting up uh, the intention, and uh, we now we know what the obstacles are, sort of like the key ingredients to a story in general, and certainly a serialized narrative. You could stretch that out for a long time if you want. Yeah. And I think one of the things that's noteworthy is that Kirkman doesn't do that. It, it, that's not the cru- It's not like Quantum Leap where he's like always trying on the hunt for the sun or something like that. Uh, they get acquainted fast enough. Yeah, it is interesting, the storytelling in Walking Dead. I think that's something people have always pointed out, whether it's characters dying, uh, surprises happening, definitely twists and turns and not, not repeating one story that just goes on forever like a quest for you, one character. You set up this world, and there's infinite fodder, you know? And if you run out of stuff to do in this town, well, what's happening in France right now? You know what I'm saying? All right, so they come out, they part ways. There's a zombie on the other side of the of the fence outside the parking lot, and Rick's about to shoot him whenever uh, whenever the other guy's like, don't do that. He can't get in. You know, why kill him if you don't need to? Kind of an interesting perspective. That, that's a, that's a post-Resident Evil uh, notion, because in those video games, and those came out like 96, 97, uh, those video games... They, they're, they're slight with the bullets, man. If you can run past these damn zombies, you better do so because they are not hooking you up with enough bullets. And, and furthermore, if you do get caught, it takes like eight of those very finite bullets to kill a zombie. Man, Ed, you know what? I, I don't know that lore, but you say that and that's exactly what it is. His comeback is you may need that bullet later. It's not you don't want to war, you don't want to make noise and then have more zombies come, which in my mind, is part of where I went, but he says, you know, save those bullets. Well, with that, you might need that bullet later. It's like, if they bite your leg, you're going to have to do the right thing and freaking blow your head off. Yeah, pretty dark stuff. And then off they go their separate ways. And before Rick leaves town, goes back to the zombie that he passed whenever he left the hospital to uh, put her out of her misery. And so shoots her in the head 
and then back in the car and on the road to Atlanta. It has all you need, you know? And, and just think about that. There's three characters that are present in this thing. Uh, it's, it's not convoluted. It's very, very clear. Like I said, man, the intention and obstacle is built in very, very clearly. You know what this character wants and needs. You definitely know what the problem is that they have to overcome. And there's a lot of mystery uh, to the whole situation also, man. It's a good setup. And having this zombie character kind of gives it that short story feel. Mm -hmm. Like that, There's a satisfying amount of an issue here. There's some closure at the end, even though there are a lot more questions like, you, like you've mentioned. Um, it does give a sense of like, that's an issue. I, I like this sequence. Weirdly, it reminds me of Chris Ware will do this where he cuts a a panel into smaller like rows and columns sometimes, like in a row of panels, uh, which is what we see to some extent here. A little bit different than Chris Ware, obviously, uh, but pretty good example of what Tony Moore is bringing. You know, showing this just how messed up this situation is, and I like that balance: Rick, zombie, Rick, and then leaving. Very simple. It's story, storytelling 101, but I mean, what else do you need in this? You know, like sometimes we get in our own way by putting too much stuff in. And kudos, I say to Kirkman, for not having a bunch of captions explaining this stuff. I always hate that. You know, it's like the pseudo-scientific <laughs> explanation that means nothing. Right. It's just garbage. The less we know, the better. Like, it's much easier to identify with Rick's plight because he doesn't have any real answers. So, pretty satisfying. Again, this was 2015, this, this reprint edition. So, what we see here, then, are some of uh, Kirkman's other books advertising for some of that stuff. I got to tell Kirkman this story, man, when, when I bumped into him at uh, New York uh, Comic Con um, two, three years ago. Um, Battle Pope got a little blurb or something in Wizard Magazine when I was up there at, at Kubert School. And I'm coming from... Pittsburgh Comic Con, year in, year out, where there's this revolving door of cartoonists. They don't deserve the name cartoonists, man. People who make these comics, uh, Jesus meets Dracula, the Knights of the Round Table meet Frankenstein, like like all this kind of nonsense, you know? And when I saw that Battle Pope, I immediately lumped it in with that stuff. These guys are going nowhere. This ain't <laughs> shit. This is not this ain't this is nothing, man. Because I just put them in that in that box that I put all of that revolving door of of uh, like douchebag money. Like I think preacher came out or something, and then like there are all these like religious yeah monster comics, you know. Uh, and then uh, obviously it's clearly wrong. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty impressive seeing kind of like the lineup of books. Um, Invincible, I think, started right before Walking Dead. There was that, give some context. Like that's two big series that ran for you know more than a decade concurrently. Famous story was that you know Valentino's publisher at this time, and uh, Valentino's not hot on a zombie book or whatever. But Kirkman's like, man, I'm going to pull this swerve, and it's going to be about an alien invasion, blah blah blah. <laughs> right. Never happens, but that happens in Invincible. Spoiler, yes. spoiler. All right. Uh, any other thoughts on Walking Dead 1, Ed? We've looked at a lot of number ones. I feel like that's a good start for a series. Relatively satisfying as a single issue, but also laying out a world. Yes, I think it, it does It does everything necessary to intrigue people enough to uh, to check out a second issue. Um, that's, that's the battle, you know what I mean? Set up this world, create an interesting enough set of circumstances that make people want to revisit it you know like what like what are what are your as a creator what are your goals here man you're just trying to make a cool comic or are you trying to like have a series have something that comes out on a regular basis and i think uh, mission accomplished man to say the least right yeah i think the main thing is that character you know in addition to the kind of the setting of that world we get to see rick and a little bit of what he's about resourceful uh, forgiving when a dude brains him with a shovel <laughs> doesn't hold a grudge um, well, he forgot de maybe <laughs> dedicated to his family and you know a mission there so you know like it is set up both the world and the character that's going to guide us further down the road makes me curious about what's going to happen in uh, the next issue and in fact i'm gonna get to it right now if you don't have anything more to add that's it for me K Fabers, you gotta like follow and subscribe to the youtube channel hit that bell we'll notify you when the next video 
is available, and uh, we're on that road. Shit, to 25,000 maybe. Yes. <laughs> You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can find Cartoonist Kayfabe merch and t-shirts at the links below this video. I wasn't lying, man. I'm cracking open this trade paperback and seeing what happens next. Give them the Martian orders, Jimmy. Read more comics.